Peace everyone, Unmask Art here, and welcome back to another live pastel tutorial. Uh, today I'm going to be finishing up our reindeer piece that we started last week. Uh, I'm going to be using Carbothello pastel pencils to finish this off. Uh, last week we used just the soft pastel, um, the Rembrandt scent, so uh, switching it up a little bit and using the pencils this time. And uh, let's see. I think, that's, uh, I think that's about all I need to cover. I hope everybody had a fantastic weekend. Uh, my weekend was great, so I hope you had a good one as well. And let's just jump right into uh, this tutorial. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a light gray. And I have, I have uh, a few colors pre-selected over here. And I have a piece of glassine paper here to protect my background and I have a sanding block for sharpening my pencil, and in fact, I'm gonna do this right now with this, uh, this gray. And I have an X-Acto knife also to sharpen my pastel pencils. I've kind of reverted from using any, uh, any pencil sharpener to using an X-Acto knife and the sanding block. It uh, has kind of become my favorite way to keep my pastel pencils sharp. Hello Gihon, uh, Mona, Cece, um, Joy, and Chrissy, and Bracci, hopefully, uh, from, uh, from Italy. Welcome to my channel. I think this might be the first time I saw you in the live stream, so I'm glad you're able to catch it. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the antlers here with this gray. This gray, by the way, is 724. And I might as well start off on this one over here. And I'm just going to fill in the antler antlers completely. Uh, this is kind of the lighter color uh, that I'm going to be using in the antlers. And then I'm going to also be using some uh, blending stick. This, uh, this blending stick that comes in the set. Uh, it's just a normal paper blender that you often use with graphite pencils. I'm going to be using that to do the blending on this part of the pastel painting. And with uh, really no uh, strategy here, I'm just filling in the antler with this gray. The outer edge, the antlers are a bit fuzzy on our reindeer here, and so the outer edge has kind of a glow to it. So I'm, I'm mainly focusing this medium gray into the center kind of core area of the antler. And then I'll, uh, I'll incorporate some of my darker pencils and also some of my lighter pencils to create that furry-like texture. But for now, I'm just going to be blocking in the antler with this color. Hello Shiny and Sana, uh, Layla. Uh, the paper I am using under my hand, this is glassine paper. Uh, sometimes, depending on where you're located uh, in Europe, it's usually referred to glassine paper. In the United States, it is called interleaving paper. It has a very... Um, it, it almost feels like baking paper a little bit, kind of like that wax paper, uh, but uh, it's not baking paper, and it has the translucency of tracing paper. It kind of feels like tracing paper, but it's a bit too smooth for that. I don't think it would take graphite very well. But I usually buy them in packs of sheets. Uh, it's very cheap. It's very cheap. I use, uh, I use a glassine paper for a lot of things storing my pastels, my finished pastel paintings, is one of the other reasons I have a whole collection of glassine paper. I bought like um, 50 A1 size sheets of glassine paper for like, I don't know, four dollars or something, uh, and it feels, feels like an endless amount, so it's very cheap paper, and it's definitely a must-have uh, if you're if you're working on pastels. It's just, uh, it's vital protecting the, the finished work and also using it underneath your hand. 
and you saw me use it for uh, the little flower details last week, the technique of uh, scraping some of the pastel and then using the glassine paper and using it to uh, press in the little speckles that I created. Oh, hello, Barbara. If you guys have any questions, uh, you know me. I always appreciate questions, so feel free to ask. Thank you, by the way, um, Layla, for the question about the glassine paper. Yeah, sometimes I overlook the the fact that I know all the supplies that I'm using. So if you guys ever have a question about my supplies. Speaking of which, I do have a link in the description for the supplies that I'm using. Uh, I, maybe I could have put a link for the glassine paper as well. Um, since you said you're in the UK, I did get this glassine paper from Jackson's Art Supply online. So you should have no problem finding it, finding it there. All right, that's a pretty good layer with that. Uh, I'm going to use a bit of blue. Uh, the, the highlight and the reflection of the sky shows up in the antlers quite a, blit, uh, quite a bit. So that's why I'm going to be incorporating this light blue and this color is 435. And I'm gonna be mainly just using this around the edge of my gray here. Just so when I mix all the colors together, I have kind of this subtle blue tone showing through everything. I'm going to try to fill in all of the empty space that I left here for the antlers. So trying to get those nice sharp edges to separate the antler from the background. Um, is it the same paper you find between pastel paper sheets? I believe so, yes. Um, I actually, I use those those sheets. If you ever buy the uh, Claire Fontaine pastel mat, which is the paper that I am working on right now, um, if you buy them in the pads, uh, each sheet of the uh, pastel mat paper has uh, a sheet of glassine paper in between it. And I use those sheets. I, I tear them out and I use them for the paper that I usually uh, set my hand on. Uh, because I don't know if it is exactly glassine paper, but uh, it feels, looks, and acts exactly like glassine paper. So uh, that is the reason they add it to those, those uh, gummed pads of the pastel mat. And I, th those are the uh, pads that I buy for the packs of um, the Claire Fontaine pastel mat. I think I buy, I think this is, um, trying to remember what size I buy, uh, 11 by 14? I think it's 11 by 14 size that I get. Um, and I just get the white, the white packs. Uh, new music. Oh, you like it, Chrissy? Oh, that's great. Uh, well, actually, this is the same music that I was using over over on Patreon as well. So I think I could have sworn you uh, you commented on the change in music. 
Could just be a different song, but it's the same playlist. Yeah, I haven't I haven't changed up my music in a while. I need to um I need to get some new music for the live streams. I feel like uh I may have been overplaying them just just a bit. Cause I just play the same uh the same playlist for each live stream and you know when I when I stream for for two hours or whatnot, uh, you're definitely gonna hear the same same song a number of times, so need to add some some new music to the playlist. All right, um, I'm going to do a quick blend with my blending stump here, and I'm just going to uh, I'm going to make sure that I have it relatively clean, just so I don't have any dark colors on the tip. There, that should be fine. And I'm just going to smooth out these two colors to fully cover the paper before adding any texture or detail to the antlers. Uh, one other thing, if you are doing this project, um, I do have the reference photo in the line art in the uh, video description as well. And of course, last week I did the background, so you'll want to check that video out too. Uh, but one of the things that I uh, want you to keep in mind when you're doing the the reindeer is that don't be afraid to go really dark with your colors. Uh, you want the reindeer to stick out from the background really, really well. And the only way to do that is to not be afraid to fully saturate your colors and to also go dark with your colors. Um, you might be looking at the reference photo right now and seeing my my antlers and be thinking, I don't know, maybe your antlers are a bit too gray, maybe a bit too gray and blue right now. Um, and then I would agree with you. But uh, this is a good base layer for the antlers uh, for that, that value, the correct value. And when you're, when you're working on the reindeer, you know, pay really close attention and study the reference photo because that's what I do. Uh, when I get my when I get my reference photos um, and I start coloring them, regardless of the project, uh, whether um, it's a landscape or a portrait or in this case a reindeer, I spend a lot of time studying my reference photos. And by studying, I mean I just sit there and stare at them and I analyze where the value changes are most important. And I try to avoid falling into any of the, uh, the optical illusions that our eyes are prone to do. Um, and when you have a, a dark object next to a light object, that dark object uh, will often appear darker than it actually is. And the same is true when you have a dark surrounding and you have what appears to be a light object, <clears throat> that object will uh, most often appear lighter than it actually is. And that that is this, the op uh, optical illusion that you have to kind of uh, not fall into when working on this reindeer. Uh, I think in most cases, I would say uh, nine out of 10 times, people that uh, might be new as an artist or um, new to pastels, and not quite comfortable and not have the, the confidence for, uh, you know, getting past these optical illusions, uh, they might be afraid to go too dark with the reindeer here. And what's going to end up happening is it's not going to, it's not going to pop out, pop off the page the way you want it. So just make sure that, uh, just make sure that you're not afraid to use the full contrast of your pencils and, and color choices. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm gonna grab a black now and I'm gonna work in the eye, but I'm just gonna sharpen the tip so that I get my detail really clean. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, I'm going to do all of my base coloring first before I go through and tr try to do any, any type of texture. Uh, so what's important with the eye is that really bright highlight that you see at the top right of the eye. Uh, for the most part, the eye is just kind of a big circle here. And uh, I'm going to just chop off like the top right section piece of the eye and into like a kind of a, I don't know, like a triangle and just leave it blank. Just like that. And that's going to be, that's going to be my highlight. I'll even throw in a touch of blue, a little bit of blue around the edge of the highlight, just like that, because that would be the sky reflecting. All right, now I am going to take a uh, dark gray. This dark gray has a, a little bit of blue in it, so this is kind of a cooler gray. And this is gonna help uh, kind of create a, a contrast between the warm and the cool colors of the image overall. Uh, oftentimes when you're outside and you have a natural light, natural light is yellow and the shadows tend to be much cooler looking. So you incorporate a bit of blue into your shadows to cool them down. And that creates a nice contrast between the shadows and uh, the highlighted areas where the sun is actually hitting. So this color here is 760. And I'm just going to uh, start coloring in my deer. And it's going to be rather dark. This is a fairly dark color and I'm just gonna work around the antlers and fill in a majority of the face down here with very little regard to any of the anatomy that's that's going on because I can actually work right over top of these dark colors with some of my lighter colors to bring back those details. I'm gonna just work around this uh, this little part of the eye, muscles of the eye. And I'm going to mainly focus on the left side where the shadows of the face actually are. So I'm going to leave some gaps here. Color all the way down to the grass. It's not going to look like much starting off, but when you when you kind of avoid the details of your subject and you focus more on the basics, which is the color and the, the value or the contrast, then uh, you get a much better uh, finishing uh, finished product because uh, if you if you go straight to the details, you're you're more likely to not get the color and the value correct, and that's going to not make your reindeer stand out nearly as much. So if you get in here with your dark colors, and you get your values correct, you get your contrast correct for the subject overall, you're going to find that your deer stands out a lot more, and you're going to like the finished product a lot more because you focused on the foundations of making the image look good and realistic, as opposed to you know trying to make it look realistic from the very beginning, focusing on all the, uh, the subtle details and things, but you can always add those in the next layers. So I'm gonna outline this ear here. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't been looking much at the uh, the live chat. Um, uh, let's see, I think I have a question here from Robin. Hello, Robin. Um, just finished my first drawing using Carbothellos. Uh, I am so frustrated with the sharpening. What do you guys use? Uh, so I actually just mentioned that at the beginning. I'm using a sanding block uh, to keep the tip sharp and to uh, remove the wood, I use an exacto knife. Uh, so here's here's how I would do it. Um, do I have uh, yeah this this lighter gray here? I can probably sharpen that. So what I do is I kind of go back about here on my pencil, and then I use my thumb. I don't I don't carve it like a wood carver. Um, what I do is I just use my back thumb here, and I kind of lever it in and just push. 
that gives me a lot more control. And then what I do is I just try to take off the wood. I really shouldn't be doing this over my pastel drawing, but I want to show you guys how I do it. So I just take off the wood like this. Very controlled. Very controlled. So once you have all the wood off around the pigment, you get this kind of long, weird looking pencil. Make sure none of it's sticking to it. There. And then uh, with the sanding block, these sanding blocks, you can buy them in like groups of four or five or something like that. Um, and this one actually has two different grits of sandpaper. This is a rougher one, which I just tend to use more often. Uh, and then you just kind of scrape it back and forth, sharpening the tip. And if you get really good at using the X-Acto knife, uh, you can sharpen your pencils to a perfect tip every time much faster than you can with any traditional pencil sharpener. All right, what color was I using now? Yeah, I need to get a sharp tip on this one. I want to get a sharp tip to outline the ear here. Now when I when I first got my uh, pastel pencils, I did get a pencil sharpener that worked really, really well for about three or four months. Um, and then now it just doesn't work at all. In fact, it, I, I must have killed it so badly with my pastel pencils that uh, I can't even really use it for my regular colored pencils now. Um, yeah, it's kind of sad. I've tried to uh, sharpen it with a, uh, a, a woodless graphite pencil, but even that doesn't repair the damage I seem to have done to it. All right, another detail over here, a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, darkness down here by the mouth, um, and then its second ear kind of creeping right behind the antler here. I'm going to outline that ear. Just like this, so that uh, subtle detail of the ear right there creeping in behind the antlers, so I don't lose that. And then let's see, it has uh, this patch of dark fur that kind of goes running down its spine. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of scribble in a little bit of this in that general area. Just to start mapping out the color changes that is occurring. And uh, I'm paying a little bit more attention to the direction that the fur is going. Just mapping out that, that fur direction is, uh, is a really good habit to, to get into on your early... Uh, your early layers, even if it's just a base layer, mapping out the direction of the fur just makes um, dealing with it later a bit easier. So it runs all the way up to here, kind of follows this line. This is like the, the spine running down the back of the neck and in between the shoulder blades. And it's about this wide. So we haven't done much. Doesn't haven't done much really as far as uh, being a complicated. You know, put some gray and blue. We are using this um, this dark gray 760. Uh, we're just mapping out some shapes, some basic shapes of dark objects. Now I need to remove some of the wood here.
perfect tip. All right, so now here um, is where the neck separates from the body. It's kind of a gap here. Um, and then it has kind of in between the body and the leg, it has a dark spot right there. And let's see, this uh, left side of its leg is in shadow because the sunlight is coming from the right as we can see from the highlight spots that occur. And then also it has, uh, it has a muscle that comes from its uh, kind of shoulder area here and wraps around its leg in this direction. So it kind of has this, uh, this shape here where the shadow is a bit darker. Kind of like that, that's its muscle coming around. And then it has its knee. I, I guess it would be a knee. Deers have weird looking knees. And the shadow continues down its leg like this. All the way until it hits the ground. So we're kind of creating like a almost a cutout, like a two-dimensional cutout, where we have just the the dark shadows, and then we're leaving it white until we grab some of our other colors. Uh, and then this leg comes up just a, just a tiny bit there. Uh, most of the color difference here is much lighter, so we're not going to we're not going to take that dark color up there. And then we have the edge of the leg again, kind of dark, all the way down to the ground. Uh, good morning, Lady Marigold. Let's map out some of the uh, anatomy on this back leg, which is a bit complex. Um, so it has this kind of triangle shape showing up about right here. It's kind of thin on top and then it widens just a little bit as it comes down behind that other hind leg. And the right side is also very dark. I presume it's a cast shadow from that other second hind leg. And it has the knee shadow coming about here. Kind of like this. And then it has that space where the sunlight hits it. Like kind of right in the center of the leg. Let's see, it has, uh, so it, you can see its muscle coming down like this, almost straight down, pointing right at the knee. And it's kind of an inverted triangle. As it gets closer to the knee, it starts to thin out a little bit. Mapping out these kind of muscular structures is what's gonna help make your reindeer look much more realistic. Paying attention to those subtle shifts and uh, in color and value also helps map out you know where the color goes in general all right so back to the center of the leg kind of comes down and
peaks at the triangle or uh, peaks at the top of the knee, kind of like this. Hello, Novix. All right, let's see. So the uh, the knee here is actually a bit brighter on this side. So I'm, I'm going to do a lighter layer of this color here. Still just kind of mapping out the anatomy a little bit. And then that left side of the leg I can darken going down to the ground. There we go. Now we have pretty much the entire structure of our reindeer mapped out. Now we can grab some of our other colors and uh, go from there. So I'm going to start with uh, that light gray that we used in the antlers uh, because we kind of have a bounce light a little bit. Um, we have the light coming from here casting some highlights that you see in the fur because this deer is actually uh, being... Uh, there's a tree off to the right somewhere and you have the direct sunlight being blocked, diffused by that tree, and then you see some spots where the leaves have gaps in the tree and the, the light is hitting the deer and it creates these kind of weird orange bright spots. And that's where the direct light is hitting. But then you have a reflective light on the left side of the deer and that's where the sky is hitting the deer. So I'm going to use some of this gray and some of the blue on that side where the deer is being uh, uh, reflecting some of the light from the sky. So I'm just going to sketch in with a bit of this gray, which is the uh, 724 once again. And then I'm going to grab the blue. Uh, that blue is the 435. And then we have some of the light being reflected up at the top near its shoulder up here. Kind of it's a, uh, I'm not sure how this bone actually will goes in the deer, but it kind of comes down. Uh, and if you notice, it comes from the peak and it slopes down and it kind of goes towards the center of this leg. So it kind of has this direction. This is where the highlight's hitting a little bit, like right in there. Um, and then just a little bit on the back hip, kind of like right there. A little bit of that blue highlight hitting. And let's see, let's go to more of a base color here. Uh, and this base color has a little bit more red in it than I want. There's a few colors that I have here that I'm gonna mix for kind of the, the overall brownish tone that our reindeer has. Uh, and what I'm gonna do with this color is just map out where those, um, where those highlights come in. So we have this one, we have this one highlight uh, right here where the, the orange color pops in. Uh, we have some of it on the neck, right in this area, kind of uh, behind the antler a little bit, right there. Uh, then we have one down here on the neck, right in that area. Uh, we have one coming on the shoulder blade a bit. Uh, the, uh, the leg kind of comes up like this, and then across the, the side we have that, that orange highlight popping through. This is going to look pretty abstract in the beginning, but once we once we get this mapped out, then we're kind of home free to just start scribbling down all of our other colors. Uh, and then on the back, we have one of those highlights popping in 
right about there. And then we have one on the front leg here, right above the knee, about right there. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna fill in those areas to protect them uh, from all the other colors. So this first color is a uh, real yellow. This is a, a 692 color. And I'm just gonna scribble in those highlighted areas with this yellow. Uh, this is gonna look really strange starting off uh, because the value of these highlights are actually darker than the rest of the deer since we um, since we don't have the dark fur colored in yet. So th this is just gonna look strange. But I recommend doing it this way because it, it protects those areas from getting darkened too much from the other layers that we're going to be putting on our reindeer. Oh, hello, uh, Anna. Yes, I did, uh, I did test out some watercolor paints yesterday and had a whole bunch of fun with it. Uh, I think I put the uh, painting away now, but uh, yeah, it was it was a blast. I used I just used a cup of water and uh, like one brush and uh, just just went to town with the paints. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Watercolors are definitely going to be uh, showing up on my channel uh, soon. Uh, I'm, uh, next week I'm uh, next week I'm planning on doing a, a drawing journal you know just hanging out doing a live stream uh, and I'll probably be playing around with some of the watercolor paints uh, the next color I'm going to add is a really bright orange uh, this one is 215 and this is just to bring in some extra orange some extra saturation into those highlights don't be afraid to uh, you know, make some colors really pop with your with your highlights. These colors are going to get softened anyway with blending and uh, adding additional colors to the fur. So and they're not going to stay real bright like this. Uh, where is my blending stick? There we go. I'm just going to smooth those highlights out and cover up the white paper. Uh, what determines your decision to blend with um, a solvent versus a stump? Uh, well, this is this is pastel pencils. I never blend with solvent uh, with pastel pencils. Uh, solvent takes forever to dry on pastel mat, and I uh, I don't feel like sitting around waiting for it to dry. So with the uh, with the pastels and the pastel mat, I always keep it a dry medium. You can blend with solvent. There's no, uh, you know, there's no harm in doing it. It it does work, and I have tried it. Um, you can actually blend with just plain alcohol, uh, which is what I actually blended with a long time ago, just doing a test. Um, but with uh, the pastel pencils, I don't see any need to blend with uh, a wet solvent of any kind because they're already so easy to blend. Oh yes, uh, so much to do and so little time. I totally agree with you. I actually, uh, earlier this morning I was, I was working on my oil painting project that I've got going on here and um, I actually uh, I actually touched it with paint today for the first time. Um, I, you know, I, I did gesso the panel, but I don't count that as paint. So I, I'm making some headway on my uh, my oil painting project and recorded plenty of video. Uh, I'm going to switch back to the 642 and just kind of color in uh, the rest of the fur a little bit uh, with a base color of this. Not everywhere, but a majority of the places, really. Just kind of get some of this color down and get, uh, get this deer covered. I want to I wanna cover up this, uh, this white paper so that I can get to the fun part. Once I get these layers down, 
then I can start incorporating some of my fine-tuning colors to get the deer looking really, really good. Uh, can you use odorless mineral spirits on pastel mat? Yes, you can. Yes. Uh, if you heard that you can't, like it doesn't handle it, um, uh, that that would not be true. Uh, I mean, unless you're like pouring a whole bottle of solvent onto the paper, nearly every paper imaginable can take uh, blending with solvent. Uh, I've used some really, really cheap papers before in the past, and I drenched them in solvent, um, partially because I barely knew what I was doing uh, in the beginning of my journey with colored pencils and solvent blending, but uh, I, I really doused the paper with solvent in the, in the beginning, and it was a flimsy, I think it was like... 80 pound paper maybe 90 but it was it was flimsy it was just barely thicker than computer paper and it handled it like a champ uh, and pastel mat pastel mat is a very durable paper so it can definitely take some uh, take some solvent for sure but uh, like I said I don't have any desire to add uh, a wet solvent or blender to my pastels. Uh, some people might uh, might enjoy that, but uh, I'm not one of them. I like the dry medium. It's quick. You don't have to wait around because you, you can't really you can't really blend with a, a wet medium, uh, any form of solvent. Uh, and then work right over top of it, you have to wait for it to dry. And the pastel mat is much thicker than, much more absorbent than many papers that I enjoy using solvent on. Uh, I don't even like to use watercolor paper uh, and solvent because I don't want to sit there and wait for it to dry. Um, I, like to, I like to just blend and then color again. And so most of the papers that I use tend to be much smoother and much more dense. So they're like a harder paper, like the Volume or the uh, Bristol smooth and plate paper. Uh, so the, the solvent, you don't even have to use that much solvent in the first place to, to, to blend. Um, but the, the solvent uh, dries really fast because it doesn't soak into the paper. And I imagine the solvent would probably soak into the uh, the pastel mat to some degree, at least, causing you to have to wait for it to dry. Oh, hello, Born Art. Good to see you again. Uh, I want to mention that uh, even though I'm just kind of covering the white of the paper here with this color, uh, I am paying attention to the direction that the fur is going. Uh, and so if you've noticed, I've kind of been doing short pencil strokes uh, and I've been mapping out the entire time. I've been mapping out the direction that the fur is, is growing. So you see here around the rib cage, the fur all, all goes in this pattern that wraps around like this. It all goes like that. But I'm not drawing big long lines because the reindeer here is uh, short animal so I'm doing short pencil strokes uh, and even though all of these pencil strokes are going to be covered with other colors and layers um, 
mapping it out just makes it easier to work on later. So that is why I'm doing that. This means it's going to take longer for you to fill in your drawing, but it's worth it because doing this from the beginning just it speeds up the later processes. And it just creates more depth in your texture. Because believe it or not, no matter how many layers you really put over top of that, those pencil strokes tend to still show three show through. Especially if you reinforce them with more layering in the same direction and also with blending in the same direction. My reindeer's looking a little strange right now. But I promise you, it will start to look more like a reindeer <laughs> once I get my other colors going. It's looking a little cartoony, uh, purple, orange, and blue reindeer. Not exactly the colors I think you would have imagined using, or imagined me using, if you're not yet following along. Bringing in some of the subtle colors that appear in your animals and your portraits and whatever project you're working on, incorporating some of those subtle colors into the base coloring can help them show through a bit more naturally later on in the project. So that is why I decided to go with this route as opposed to, you know, kind of working in one area at a time. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I'll just, you know, maybe just work on the head and I'll get the values and all the colors and I'll just be switching pencils and all of that. But uh, for this project, I thought it I thought it'd be a little bit easier to do it this way. So that is why I decided to change it up. It's always good to change things up every once in a while. Uh, I'm going to take a bit of gray now. That uh, same light gray that I was using, the 724, uh, the fur has a lot of gray in it. So where I see the, the gray kind of showing a bit more, I'm just going to incorporate a bit of this gray in that, that area. And it's mostly around the highlighted spots of the fur. The gray actually is a lighter color than the dark brown that the fur actually is. So these grays should pop out to be uh, a bit more of a highlight. Yes, I, I am doing short strokes like the fur, uh, even though I'm just filling in the base layers. Um, would I advise this method on watercolor? Um, I cannot advise anything on watercoloring, considering how this past weekend was the first time I ever touched watercolor. Uh, though the, the project that I did, the little practice thing that I did, uh, went quite well and I had an absolute blast, it was... Uh, definitely not an animal <laughs> and uh, so uh, I cannot uh, I cannot advise yet with watercolor <laughs> I am much too new to that medium maybe maybe after my second painting I can give you some uh, <laughs> I can give you some watercolor tips uh, my first tip actually I can give you I can give you one tip with watercolors and that is if you haven't tried them you gotta I waited too long. I waited much too long to try them out. They are they are really, really fun. And um, even if you were even if you're a bit messy, I was rather messy uh, with my watercolors. I was not trying to be um, very 
precise at all uh, with my coloring, uh, with my painting process or anything. I kind of just took the paint and uh, I just dipped my brush in a whole bunch of water and just slopped the paint down. Uh, I, I painted rather fast, very rushed, and uh, the project still still came out uh, really nice looking in my opinion. I think it came out rather nice. Maybe I should just go grab it really quick and I can show you guys what I did with watercolors. So uh, let me fill in this this white real quick on the face. I'll fill in this, uh, this white and then I'll go grab my watercolor paintings that I did this weekend. Because I did two of them, actually. So the first project that I did is, um, uh, not only did I draw it super fast, uh, I didn't use pencil at all, I just grabbed an ink pen and scribbled down kind of a city scape scene. Uh, and then you can probably tell from the paint itself that uh, I painted it really fast, and I did uh, painted it really fast. And I just kind of uh, threw a bunch of water on the paper. It's a little warped, but uh, it still came out kind of nice. Uh, and then I messed up in the sky uh, because I added too much water, and it took some of the gray from this beam here. Uh, and yeah, I didn't even bother finishing it. There's supposed to be a bunch of lines that uh, I was draw gonna draw across, but uh, yeah, you can see that it uh, it was rushed, and this was my very first watercolor painting. But uh, I had fun with it regardless, it was, it was a fun project. Uh, my next one, my next one I spent a bit more time uh, with my inking. I inked it rather nicely, um, but I still painted it very, very fast. Uh, and I, I actually incorporated a bit of gouache that I had uh, for the highlights in the hair. Uh, in the eyes and then on the cheeks right here and here and a little bit on the nose and the lips. Uh, I added a bit of white gouache after it dried but um, I was quick. Uh, I just I did not mix my colors properly in any way. I just kind of like uh, had them um, set out and just dipped my brush and I used one really large brush. It was like I don't know uh, like a, a size 14 round brush um, and I just slopped it down. Uh, the hair, I had no idea what I was doing with the hair, uh, but I took, um, after I colored in the hair with some brown and some reds and just a whole bunch of other colors, I took a, a thinner brush, uh, dipped it in water, and I just really slowly lifted off some of the watercolor. Uh, it was, yeah, it was a fun project, but as you can see, uh, it's rushed, but um, it was fun regardless. So that's, that's what I did this weekend, and it was a bunch of fun. Um, I heard you did a watercolor stream? A watercolor stream? Fellow artist said you made them sick because you are great and wonderful if there is anything you can't do with art. Um, yeah, at this, at this stage in my life, I'm... I'm not sure there is anything that uh, I'm afraid to try with art. Uh, it, pretty much any medium I pick up, a lot of the same rules apply that I that I generalize about art, um, and that just makes uh, new mediums, you know, fun uh, and and rather quick to learn. Uh, there's always different techniques that you have to adjust to when you uh, start a new a new medium but um, you know art is uh, to, to create good art you need you need patience you need um, a tiny bit of practice um, and then you you need experience and experience if you're experienced with using a brush you can pretty much do any medium that uses a brush watercolor acrylics oil um, 
you know, you, you just, you mix the colors the same. I mean, when working with watercolors, if you want the color lighter, you just add water. That's probably the, the easiest uh, paint mixing uh, procedure imaginable. You just, yeah, you just add water. Uh, if you want it darker, just use less water. <laughs> and that's basically the uh, process I went through with that painting there. All right, let's see here. I need to grab some browns. Let's uh, let's bring this deer uh, back to earth with uh, some natural tones. So I'm gonna grab a brown, uh, the 635. And I'm just gonna start uh, around the face, I, I guess, and just bring in some browns. I'll worry about uh, the anatomy and the highlights in another layer but uh, definitely need to bring in some more natural looking colors. After I do this color, I think I might uh, I think I might just blend it out and then see where we're at as far as values and color go. Now with this, uh, with this dark brown color, you'll notice that the highlights uh, start to appear as actual highlights as opposed to the, uh, the weird blotchy orange and yellow blobs that a reindeer has. Um, and then also the, the deer has uh, what's called a salt and pepper like coloring of its fur. Uh, and it's called that because it kind of looks like the mix of salt and pepper. Uh, and a lot of animals have this. Uh, I did a tutorial of a baby squirrel last year that, uh, that had a really uh, salt and pepper kind of gray and brown. Uh, kind of gray and brown coloring to it. Uh, I did that tutorial over on Patreon. So I'll give you kind of a quick tip on how to approach that salt and pepper look in your drawings. It's very simple. Um, and it's essentially just creating like little mountain ranges of fur color in a darker color. And you, you, you'll you notice the salt and pepper look um, mainly right here along the the neck where you have this centered dark fur and then it spreads out from there and that salt and pepper look is is really really easy to actually capture and i'll show you that trick when i get to that uh, part of the drawing here oh hello renate i didn't see you come in I uh, hope everybody is in, uh, enjoying the live stream so far. Uh, let's see, I've been streaming for about an hour now. So hopefully you guys are enjoying it. If you are, make sure you uh, give the video a thumbs up so that I so that I know that you're enjoying it. And uh, give me some ideas for the next the next tutorial, next live tutorial you'd like to see me do. I was I was thinking about. Uh, going all out and doing a pastel portrait. Uh, I have never done a pastel portrait other than like the size of my thumb, like the face being that large. 
So it would be a, it'd be a real challenge. I've been wanting to do a, a portrait with pastels in it for a while now. I love doing portraits. But I have to admit that I, I would be a little, little nervous doing a live stream of a pastel portrait, but I could at least do it and kind of talk through my process, um, my fears, my worries. It would be a little less of a tutorial and just more of a, a journey watching me attempt my first pastel portrait. Uh, so now what I'm doing with this color, you'll notice down here I'm creating some shapes. And what, I, what my thought process is here is that I want to start creating the anatomy of the, of the reindeer. And you'll notice that uh, it has kind of this gap here where the muscles, the muscles attach. Kind of comes down like this and it wraps up right in this area. So I'm just concentrating my pencil strokes, creating those subtle muscle structures and then same thing down here. Just kind of focusing that color a little bit. And now we get a bit of variety in our values. Uh, it would be cool. I do a lot of graphite portraits. Oh, uh, that's cool. I've, I'm actually thinking um, over on Patreon. Uh, if you don't know this, I stream on Patreon. Last week I did three streams. This week I'm going to do three streams. Um, be streaming tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, we've been working on a project for uh, a little bit too long. <laughs> But uh, everybody's been enjoying it. A uh, fairy tale coloring page that I created on a live stream about a month ago. And uh, this week I'm going to be starting a new project, hopefully, if I can get this uh, other one done. Uh, and I was planning on doing a, a tutorial on graphite portraits. Because um, there's, a, there's a, some common mistakes that people make with their graphite portraits. Mainly it has to do with the skin, ironically. You'd think that uh, doing a portrait and just uh, monochromatically it would be easier, but um, same mistakes, skin tone mistakes. You think uh, skin tones in graphite would be rather easy, but people, people struggle with them quite a bit. Uh, mainly just the, the value, get the value incorrect. People always, always, uh, people are always afraid to go dark on the skin, to add any graphite to the skin, and they end up uh, just getting a really washed out looking portrait. So I thought doing a graphite tutorial on portraits would be would be a fun project. So I'll be starting that on Thursday. Tomorrow I'll be uh, working on the fairy tale coloring page, and then Wednesday I will also be working on it. Uh, and Wednesday we should be able to finish it up. I've been dying to finish it up. Uh, I've been really enjoy working on it, but uh, I want to get it done because it's coming together so nicely. Yeah, going uh, going dark with uh, essentially any medium at all uh, is a very common fear uh, among people. It's definitely it's definitely what holds a lot of people back from creating great artwork. Tons and tons of people create really good stuff, uh, but if they could get over their fear of going dark with their colors. Uh, they would they would go from from good to great really quickly 
I think that's probably the fastest way to progress as an artist is to just force yourself into uncomfortable positions and go really dark where it's where it's supposed to be really dark but uh, where you constantly kind of hold back a little bit uh, this reindeer here wouldn't be a bad project for you to try to work on that that color fear going dark on the reindeer would uh, definitely benefit the overall composition of the piece and as you can see here I am not holding back at all even though inside I'm secretly freaking out because if I mess up it's very embarrassing to do it on a live stream can't hide my mistakes when I do it live I always get a little bit anxious I won't lie many of you guys hold me in very high regard to my artistic skills and uh, yeah it doesn't help <laughs> Does not help. I still I still have the same fears everybody else does. I'm trying to get my colors right, uh, pretending like I know what I'm doing as I instruct everyone how to do things. I think that's probably the uh, the um, most uh, honest appraisal of uh, my teaching, my art teaching is that secretly I don't know what I'm doing. I just pretend really, really well. And you guys are so convinced that you'd argue with me. That's how good I am. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's do some blending now. I got some good colors down. Actually, no, I lie. I'm not going to blend yet. I'm going to add some of this, this orangish brown. This is a 620. It's, it's a bit softer. Um, and I, I just want to get one more quick layer of color here before blending out. Uh, this is a good transition between some of those highlighted areas and the rest of the fur. This is going to add a bit of warmth into the rest of the fur overall because that, uh, that purpley reddish brown color that I uh, used in the beginning for the base color, it's a rather cool color. It's not as warm as this, uh, this orange here, so getting, getting a bit of this down I think would be beneficial before blending out. Now I can blend out. My goal will be to make sure all of the paper is completely covered. No more gaps. No more little pinholes. Just going to blend everything out. Uh, Inktober is soon here. Am I going to be participating this year? Yes, yes, I am going to be participating. Um, I'm, I'm excited for Inktober. I'm going to be doing exactly what I did last year, which means another very painful Inktober. 
but super fun and hopefully uh, hopefully I gain as many new friends as I did last year because last year was super beneficial I uh, met a whole whole bunch of awesome new people and uh, Nugget will definitely be returning for this year Nugget the uh, unspoken star of Inktober he will definitely be reappearing I haven't even I think the prompts are actually already posted they might be but um, I'm pretty sure they are I haven't even looked at them yet but I bought I bought some supplies for Inktober a couple weeks ago and I am ready to go. I made a small error uh, on my um, my sketchbook choice, but um, it's an easy workaround. Uh, see my sketchbook. It says 50, 50 pages, um, but. Uh, it's really just 25 and they're counting front and back, which I find to be retarded um, to advertise it as 50, but um, it's, it's such a great sketchbook that uh, I'm, willing, I'm willing to overlook it and just do two prompts on a single page, not front and back, but on the same on the same page. Now that I'm blending out, uh, I'm I'm moving I'm moving my blender also just like a pencil in the direction of the uh, the fur, and you can start to see that uh, the texture of the fur is showing three showing through. I have those short pencil strokes in my blending stump here. And I'm getting a nice, uh, nice texture overall. And you can see that uh, our highlights are actually starting to look like highlights. Still a bit of work to do in the fur. Another two layers, I imagine. Some fine tuning with my anatomy. But uh, for the most part, if you can get to this stage right here with the same values, let's see if I zoom out. That's the wrong direction. So you can, you can start to see just how much the, the reindeer stands out from the page. So if you can get to this stage here, the fine tuning is going to be the easy part. Then all you got to do is just grab your colors and kind of work in the small sections, small areas, getting getting the face to look right, getting the body to look right, all of that. Grab some white, touch up some of the highlights, and just reinforce all the fur texture. That's the easy part. I would say getting to this stage right here where I'm at, uh, that's that's the difficult stage. That's the difficult part of this drawing. Everything's been rather easy up to this point, um, but you just have to kind of be brave with your with your colors in the beginning. Trust that. Uh, trust your instincts, and uh, you know don't uh, don't go real light to play it safe. Don't do that. Because what ends up happening is that you go really light and you think, you, you kind of convince yourself that you're already dark enough. If you just kind of go bold from the very beginning, you'll, uh, you'll have much more confidence later in the layers. My reindeer's looking a bit too red, so. That's one thing I will correct.
All right, that's a, that's a good blending stage. Starting to, starting to come together. I'm gonna work on the, uh, the face now. And let's see here. Got a few, few colors I'm thinking about. I thought I had two browns. What'd I do with my other brown? Did I really only have this one? Oh, well. I'm gonna use this brown. Give it a quick sharpen. Uh, this is the 635 brown. And I'm actually gonna grab my medium gray, the 724. I gotta sharpen that one as well. I'm gonna be switching between colors rather quickly here. Uh, let's see, what other color should I grab here? I think I'm gonna grab black. Or actually, no, I'm gonna grab a 770. Uh, this is actually a purpley color. This is a really dark purple. So these are the colors and black. So I'm gonna have black, I'm gonna have 770, uh, 724 gray, and the 635 brown. So I'm just going to uh, come in here with a bit of brown, uh, grab my purpley color, just uh, darken up some spots. And that's what I'm using the purple for really, is to uh, get those really dark spots. Instead of just having flat black, the purple will just help give it some dimension. Some uh, deeper tone, a little bit of black now. And I'm gonna grab my gray, add a few touches of highlights. Grab my blending stump. I'm gonna just blend this out as I go. I'm gonna just focus on the face, make sure I get uh, get everything the way I want it to look. The transitions between colors are very, very subtle here. Everything is really dark. So since we started with the dark color in the first place, we, uh, we can slowly and gradually bring out the highlights without really lightening the whole piece. All right. I think I want a lighter gray. Something, ah, uh, here we go. Yes, this is the one I want. Uh, this really light gray, this is 110. Uh, I'm gonna bring this into the right side of the face where it's being hit by more light. Work these highlights around the eye a bit. All of the fur here is actually rather gray. And it's a bit lighter than that darker gray that I had. So that's why I'm grabbing this lighter one. I could always grab white as well, but I'm afraid that might be too bright. I don't want to go too bright too fast. And just blend that out a little bit. Oh, thanks, Cece. Uh, why did I start blending in dark area? Does your blender not pick up other colors? Uh, is that a luminance blender? Um, I chose to blend in the dark areas um, just for no reason at all. Um, that's the honest truth uh, with that question, the first part. Um, does the blender pick up darker colors? Yes, which um, 
I use this side for light colors, this side for dark colors. So it has two sides. Um, and you can, these are really easy to clean anyway. So and just sand them, sand, sand the color off. Uh, and then is it a luminance blender? No, no, it is not. Um, this is a uh, pencil smudger stump blender. Uh, it's made of tightly rolled paper. And it came with the Carbothello set of pastels, so. All right, a little bit more black here. Just work on the details of the eye a bit. Here's some, the brown for the kind of eyelid. And I'm gonna use the medium gray not the light gray, the medium gray to lighten up that spot right above the eye very slightly. Um, so more of the medium gray down here underneath the eye. Grab my brown, work on the details of that ear. This is the, uh, the finessing stage of this area anyway. Just kind of fine tuning the details, adding a bit more texture, getting the face complete. And let me grab that white. I think I'm going to grab the white and uh, work on the antler a little bit. It's a highlight on the antler right there. And the antlers still need texture, but can uh, add some of the highlighted parts rather easily. Uh, let's go with the uh, purple again. I'm going to go back here add some depth to the shadow. A little bit on the ear as well. And you know what? The ear has a bit of blue on it. So I'm just going to toss in a tiny bit of blue before grabbing that medium gray. And then the brown. just to blend that out. There we go. Now it's not too highlighted. Uh, even add a touch of purple in there. And blend it out one more time. Let's go to the back of the head with some purple, creating some fur texture here, a touch of brown as well, and blend it out very gently. Uh, yes, you can, uh, like Lady Mary Gold said, you can, you can get these pencil stumps literally everywhere. They are 
super duper cheap. Very, very common. Let's add some fur into the ears here. Some brown. Grab the light gray, add some highlighted fur. And let's see, um, let's highlight, let's grab that white again and highlight the other antler really quick. I'm just going to come over to this antler and toss in a few white highlights around the edges. still look really flat because I don't have any of the shadows on them so uh, just ignore that for now I'll get there all right um, let's see here I'm gonna take the, the dark brown and just sharpen it a little bit start adding some fur texture some more prominent fur texture and I want to uh, also give you the little little trick on creating that salt and pepper look um, and the trick is to maintain the fur direction and pencil length but instead of working in straight lines what you do is you create little mountains so instead of working like for instance if I were to go straight across that would just create normal looking fur texture of any dominant color but if you do the same thing, but you go up and down and back and forth with your direction, kind of creating like a mountain peak like that, that is going to break the color up and create kind of a salt and pepper look. So you just keep going back and forth, creating these little mountain peaks uh, in your direction and that creates the salt and pepper look. Because if you ever kind of unfocus your eyes a little bit uh, with fur that is dual colored in that way, that has that salt and pepper look, if you unfocus your eyes, you'll, you'll see those mountain ranges pop up. And this works with, uh, with any medium it's a pattern it's a it's a it's a pattern that occurs in the fur that gives it that that look so whether you're painting it or coloring it with pastels or colored pencils you just follow that mountain type pattern and you'll you'll create the salt and pepper look as you can start to see on the the neck uh, i'm going to grab some medium gray Do the same thing with the medium gray now. Create little mountains throughout the fur. I'm going to do the same thing a little bit on this side. One second. Sorry about that. My window blind was open and uh, the light was reflecting off the, the floor and blinding me. <laughs> Could barely see anything. I had to close it. It's driving me nuts. All right, uh, this is the light gray, and I'm going to use some of this light gray and continue that salt and pepper look in the uh, fur on the neck here. Uh, 
Uh, are these dry pastel pencils? Yes, uh, these are dry. They're not oil-based. All right, I'm gonna grab some purple and deepen that fur that runs down the center of its back. Just to incorporate a little bit of purple in there. There we go. Now you can you can start to see that those weird orange yellow spots we created real long time ago, they're actually appearing to be highlights now. Starting to look starting to look uh, real natural after an hour long uh, wait of really awkward looking colors. I'm gonna just run very lightly a, a bit of texture with the brown through the highlight here on the neck creating just a subtle amount of texture there all right now we can continue on to the body but i think i'm going to just start right here on the leg with the brown just continuing my layers of texture. Paying very close attention to the direction the fur is going. Very light, short pencil strokes. Again, through that highlight there, just running a few very thin lines to create that subtle texture. Uh, this leg is actually like 90% done with just the base layers. Got the color down really, really well. I'm going to just incorporate a bit of the purple in some of the shadows just to deepen them a little bit. Cool them down. I'm going to grab the uh, the light gray for a bit of highlight here. Some of these some of these spots have just a touch of gray highlight right here on the edge of the leg. And then also down here by the highlight tone down a bit of that yellow and orange color. I'll grab my blender just to smooth it out very, very slightly. I want to keep the texture there, but just to blend it a tiny, tiny bit. There we go. I think that leg is good. I'm going to grab the brown again, start back up here on the body. Always making sure I am brushing my pencil in the direction of the fur. That is, that is probably the easiest thing to mess up when you're doing furry animals. Is you just, you forget and you start coloring it in too boldly. And by boldly, I mean the thickness of the line and too broad. Just want to slowly fill in the fur, following that direction and pencil stroke di discipline. Run through that highlight a little bit, break it up, and allow the fur texture to show through.
Uh, let's grab let's grab a touch of gray, the medium gray. Do the same thing through here. Kind of working one patch of fur at a time. Let's grab the purple now, deepen up some of these shadows going on. Work on that transition between the fur from the body and the neck, right in this spot. It has a, a bit of a, a shadow kind of running through it, creating that subtle separation. And we have this highlight here. I'm going to use the medium gray to tone down that highlight that we added early on. Just right over top of it. And we just added a bit of blue there, reflecting the sky. So I'm just going to kind of soften it a bit with the gray. Use the lighter gray now just bring out the light, kind of feathering the edge of that highlight so that it blends into the fur really nicely. That highlight runs down this part of the arm, the front leg. I guess reindeer don't have arms, do they? There we go. A bit of this light gray across the uh, the rib cage right here transitioning from that super bright highlight to something a little less bright uh, people have said to me that the picture I produce is not really mine as I have listened to the tutor and used his choices. Do you agree? Am I learning in my book? Um, the picture that you create is always yours, no matter what. Nobody, nobody moved your hands for you. Uh, you were in control the entire time. Whether you are listening to a, tut a tutorial like this or you're reading instructions from a book, um, or you didn't take the reference photo, um, the odds are the people that said that to you aren't artists. Um, nobody can move your hands for you. Whatever you produce is yours. And if you're learning from a tutorial and you produce something that you really like, then that's all that really matters. Art, art has no room for negativity, and I would consider such a blatant false statement to be a rather negative thing to say. If you did it, it is, it is yours. That is the bottom line. And I imagine there's plenty of people that would agree with that sentiment. It's it's just like um, it's just like people that uh, you know critics of movies or music. Uh, I would say 99% of the time 
they are neither a uh, screenwriter, director, cameraman, or musician uh, when they uh, are, are criti making their critiques. They are critiquing or giving their opinion based on zero experience and just flat out an opinion. I think there's a, a huge difference between an opinion from a person that, uh, that doesn't do what they're critiquing and uh, an opinion from a person that, that does do what they're critiquing. For instance, I am an artist and I think that if I critique somebody else's artwork, I have a certain degree of authority uh, in my opinion as opposed to somebody that does not create artwork. So I tend to flat out disregard any opinion that comes from somebody critiquing something that they do not do themselves. Because anybody can have an opinion about anything. But if you don't do it, your opinion is uh, worth a lot less. Yeah, if I mean, if you guys follow my tutorials and you create something that you're proud of, you would never have to feel guilty by sharing it and saying, you know, this is what I created. You know, only if the person asks for more information. Perhaps, you know, if you're enthusiastic about uh, sharing my, my channel and what I do for a living, then, you know, feel free to share where you learned it from. My, my goal is so that my goal is that everybody that follows my tutorials, regardless of the medium, regardless of the subject, in the end can create something that they really like and share it with the people they care to share it with and, and take credit for it because it is your work after all. I'm not, I'm not uh, too concerned with, with any amount of people that, uh, that may take one of my tutorials, complete an artwork based from it, and then go out and try to get famous from that. I, I, I have very little concern that that is ever going to happen. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold any grudges against somebody that uh, pretended that uh, it was purely their their work, their idea, uh, if they were to follow one of my tutorials. That also would not upset me to any degree. Because I imagine that uh, for the people that enjoy my work, enjoy learning from me, they'll be back to learn more. And uh, that's what I bank on. That's about all I look forward to. I'm just uh, switching between colors, balancing out all the textures and all the colors going on here. So if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm still using all those same colors, medium grays, the purples, the browns, following all of my same rules, pencil direction, pencil length, creating the fur texture through a series of layering.
All right, I think, um, I think I'm gonna add another color here. So I, I used a little bit of this color. This is that 620 bit of orange. I think it's going to be a good, a good choice here. I need to sharpen it a bit though. Oops. There we go. All right. I'm just going to incorporate a bit of orange into the into the fur now. I haven't blended out this area just yet. Um, I'm going to use this color mainly around the highlights so that they feel a bit more natural in those areas. A little bit on the underbelly here too. Uh, if you mess up, can pastel mistakes be easily repaired, or is it messed up forever? Uh, one of the great things about pastels is how forgiving they are. Um, there is almost, there is almost, and I have to stress the word almost, uh, no mistake that you can make in pastels that can't be corrected to some degree. Uh, obviously, there are unforgivable mistakes with pastels. For instance, if I was to take my dark purple pencil here and put a big old streak through my background, you're gonna have to start over on that one. But, uh, you know, say I grab, let's let's make a mistake. Let's, let's make a mistake together. And what's a really off color? Um, I'm gonna go with, uh, I'm gonna go with this fuchsia color here. What if I just like, streak of fuchsia color. I, I, I don't know if you can see that, but there is an obvious just off streak of this color through the fur. Now I'm just gonna, uh, since I just made the mistake, it's sitting on top. So I'm just gonna grab my eraser and just see if, how much of that color I can pull up. Yeah, it's pretty much gone. Yeah, it's pretty much gone. And now I'm just going to ignore it completely. Go back to coloring. And you'll never know that I made the mistake. You wouldn't have been able to do that with colored pencils. But pastels are very forgiving. Easy to correct little mistakes like that. You have a lot of leeway with your uh, with your mistakes, so I don't I don't suggest doing what I just did, grabbing a random color uh, and scraping it through your project, even if it was just a teeny tiny scrape. But uh, now I don't even know where it was. I think it was like in this area somewhere, but I can't even see it. That's what I like about pastels. They're very, very forgiving. Very forgiving. Let's see here. Um, I think I'm going to go with some gray. A bit more gray on the top side. On the hip back here as well. Just before blending out. A little bit more gray in this area here. Uh, 
All right, uh, now I'm gonna grab my blending stump and just uh, do a bit of light blending. I'm not really pressing in anymore. I'm just, uh, there's enough layers that uh, pastels will move rather easily. So I'm just kind of getting rid of the grainy pencil-like texture that is left behind when using pencils. And this is just gonna soften the fur a little bit. Like, uh, I, I almost can't stress how small of pressure, how light of pressure. I'm basically dusting. That's how light of a touch I am on the paper here. Just enough, not really to spread the pastel, but to remove the pencil grain texture. That is uh, about what I'm doing here. I'm going to grab the uh, light gray and then add a few highlights, a few lasting highlights into the fur. My deer turned out to be a bit more red than I anticipated from that base color, but I like it. I like the, the reddish fur. I think it's a bit more interesting than the reference photo. All right. Now, I'm going to grab the light gray. I think I can put my other pencils down. And I'm just going to come in here and do a bit of highlighting. Looks awesome. Well, thank you, Robin. I'm glad you like the way it's coming together. Yep, I've finally successfully worked through the ugly stage, and now I'm just to the the finessing stage. I, I really want to come up with a better word for this stage than finesse, because I feel like I use that word way too much, um, and it makes me feel uncomfortable. But uh, I can't come up with better words. If you guys have a better word for finessing, perhaps somebody could go to uh, th thesaurus.com and find me, find me a better word for finesse. Because this is the, the, the subtlety stage of details and just kind of adding the last little bits of texture and color changes. This is the stage that I enjoy the most because you can you can spend a lifetime here. You can just do this to your heart's content and uh, you can you can spend forever just doing this. Uh, and usually I cut the stream off here because <laughs> uh, I I enjoy to just sit back and do this kind of off camera sometimes and finish off any mild details that I see. But we have one more thing we got to do. We got to add the grass in front of the deer and then we have to untape the edges. We also have to finish the antlers. Okay, hack offable. Um, oh, and uh, take care of Chrissy. Um, after you put down the initial layer, how do you know what colors to layer over it? Uh, there's, there's no easy way to describe that. Um, the reason I like doing these live tutorials is because you guys get, you guys get my, my, uh, my uh, instinct. You get my instinct unfiltered for creating this piece. Um, I don't have much of a game plan from the beginning when I do this. Uh, I, it's all based on experience. Uh, I know what to add and what to add next 
because of my experience. Um, and you can't teach that. But what I can do is do live streams that give you my, um, my instinctual color choices. And then I verbalize what I'm thinking, like, why do I choose this color? What, what is the purpose of this color? Um, and I, I explain that the best of my ability so that you kind of get insight to my instincts uh, because there is no shortcut for t choosing. There's, there's no secret method that I have yet to discover. Uh, I often change and vary my color choices and base colors. Um, usually, and for a general rule, when it comes to base colors, I try to choose um, colors that resemble the overall color of my subject. That's kind of what I tend to uh, go towards. So if my if my reindeer is brown, then I tend to to choose base colors centered around that brain that brown color. Um, I'm using a bit of white now to bring out some highlights in the highlights. So some texture, some white fur popping through here. Uh, hopefully that somewhat answered your, your question for base layers. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a general rule and And it varies. Uh, polishing the detail. Oh, I do like that one. I do like that. The polish stage. Yeah, that's that's real cute. Um, synonyms for finesse, skillfulness, expertise, subtlety. I, I do really like the word subtlety. I'm a fan of subtlety. Flair. Hmm. Panache. That's a fun word to say. Uh, Alon, polish, artistry, virtuoso, no, virtu, virtuosity, virosity, no, that's, what, I don't even know how to pronounce that word, mastery, uh, the pol, the polish one is good, polish is a good one, I like that one, yeah, polish is a good one. The polishing stage, that's where we're at. We're in the polishing stage, We've got to polish it up. Now I feel like I'm gonna over say that one and next week I'm gonna need another new word. All right, just touching up some of the highlights there. Uh, now I'm gonna grab my brown and I'm gonna come in here and create a bunch of dots for the antlers. Little teeny tiny dots. The fuzziness of the antlers is caused by these tiny dots, and that is how I'm going to shade it. This will give the antlers the texture they need and the dimension. Go from 2D to 3D real quick with just a bunch of dots. I'm not going to lie, I almost forgot about the antlers. Almost forgot. Uh, you could be making dots all day long here, too. There's a billion of them.
the almost one antler done. A little bit more. I'm just gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do this brown color. Um, I would suggest incorporating a couple other colors, perhaps. A few colors will make the antlers look better when adding the dots. So maybe some some blues, some some black, probably some black dots would in the the really dark spots would uh, probably be a good good idea. But I am trying to finish this off because I have oh, goodness gracious. Um, I, I I don't have a lot of time. This this stream went on a little bit longer than I anticipated. I have a lot of dishes I need to do. My wife is going to be coming home soon, and I need to make pierogi tonight because it is my mother-in-law's birthday today, and uh, I'm making dinner. And. Uh, I make my pierogi from scratch, which means it takes me a really long time to do. And I need to do them about a half hour ago is when I needed to start. And the kitchen is an absolute disaster right now. I don't even know how. I don't even know how it's a disaster. Let's see, almost done with the antler. Yeah, I'm gonna just throw some grass in front of our reindeer here. All right, I would suggest you add more dots than what I added here. Um, looks pretty good, not, not too terrible, uh, but I need to take some Take a green pencil here. Maybe not that green. No, this is a good green, but I need to sharpen it. There we go. And I'm just gonna take this green and yeah, this isn't the right color green. I'm gonna have to uh, grab my soft pastels, but I'm, I'm gonna use this green anyway. Just a bit of green in front of the uh, hooves. Maybe this lighter green will look better. Yeah, this is a little bit better. Not exactly the right color. This is a bit darker. That's, yeah, that's a little better there. It's about the color that I need. Uh, blender. Just smudge that a bit. All right. Uh, I'm going to continue polishing this up off the live stream, but I'm going to first zoom out. And it is time for everybody's favorite part, which is the untaping. So. I know I'm rushing that last little bit, but uh, I don't have the colors out. And I have been streaming for a little bit over two hours now, so I need to, um, yeah, I need to start cooking. <laughs> so I'm going to peel this up so we can see our lovely clean lines that my tape left. This is my favorite part. And we're pretty close to the absolute finished piece. Close enough. Now I can finish up those details later. 
no big deal. And there we go. So there is the reindeer in the meadow scene. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Hopefully you um, enjoyed working on this pastel piece with me. And hopefully you learned a lot. Um, it was definitely a fun project and I'm very pleased with the outcome. Uh, I'll, set, I'll uh, post a picture of this later once I actually finish it 100%, you know, finish polishing my details. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming by and spending this time with me. Um, I cannot wait for the next live stream, and if you can't either, then uh, make sure you join me over on Patreon, where I live stream much more regularly, <laughs> especially these past couple weeks. Um, anyways, you guys have a lovely rest of your day, and I will see you next time. Take care. Peace.